moderator. Dato' Masu Osman, Deputy Chief Minister One of Penang. Zara Q. Juhari, the organizing uh, chairman for the conference coalition of clean governance. Distinguished speakers who are with us this morning, Dato Ambiga Srivinavasan, the uh, co chair for Berse, from overseas, distinguished speakers, Professor Aman Nasution from Indonesia, Madam Risa Hontiveros from Philippines, Dr. Sherry Taukong from China. Mr. Donald Lo from Singapore, Mr. Nisit Chopania from Laos, and of course our own Dato Paulo from Transparency International Malaysia. And we've got a, a guest uh, from the Philippines, my good friend Mr. Ronald Lamas, the Political Affairs Secretary to the President of the Philippines, who's also personally here this morning. All the distinguished guests and members of media, a very good morning and salam berse to everyone. <clears throat> On behalf of the Penang Institute, as well as the State Government of Penang, allow me to start by wishing everyone a warm welcome, both to Penang, as well as to the inaugural conference of the ASEAN Coalition of Clean Governance. Organizing a conference in the midst of the month-long, internationally renowned Georgetown Heritage Fest with the theme of this conference, What Enables Clean Governance in Democracies, ASEAN's Perspectives, is appropriate. After all, Georgetown's future as a UNESCO World Heritage City is inextricably intertwined with its survival link to clean governance. Clean governance is an issue that is very close to my heart. It is one of the reasons why I'm here as the Penang Chief Minister. And one of the critical reforms in my administration which will decide whether I will still be around. Therefore, it is important to understand the correlation between development and clean governance. History is rife with numerous examples throughout the world where weak governance, corruption, and abuse of power have resulted in grinding poverty and the widening wealth inequality and income disparity. When a government is corrupt and inefficient, it is almost a certainty that its economic development will be unbalanced, inequitable and even unfair, with its social economic distribution skewed in favour of the cronies. Clean governance can be broadly defined has a system that ensures policies are made for public interest through the essential mechanism that establishes institutions which builds integrity in leadership and decision making and effective internal control to check and punish corruption as well as rewarding whistleblowers. More specifically, we need to understand whether clean governance is relevant in the ASEAN context to engender social, political, economic and sustainable development. It is for this reason that the Penang Institute has organised this conference today by bringing together leading proponents of clean governance from around the region with the aim of raising awareness of clean governance, discussing its enabling factors, setting up institutions, exchanging experience and more importantly, establishing a culture of clean governance throughout ASEAN. We are gathered here in extraordinary times. The global picture today is one that would have been unrecognisable just a decade ago. Today, we see totalitarian governments and once untouchable dictatorships being toppled one after another like dominoes. And we are very pleased to see the first democratically elected president of Egypt. Meanwhile, the Western economies are teetering on the edge of a meltdown, consumed by the weight of a crunching debt crisis 
that offers little room for optimism. We may live in extraordinary times. The effects of the global economic crisis are already obvious. ASEAN economies will not be spared and is expected to face weakening exports and a slowdown in FDIs. As a result, economic management has become an increasingly challenging effort. In these extraordinary times, some say we require extraordinary ideas or extraordinary efforts. However, I feel that we should not forget that the return to the basic principle of not, of not just doing the right thing, but doing it right, I think is important. ASEAN countries are bound together, not only by geography and economy, but also by cultural and political values. In that sense, this great economic challenge that we are facing is a collective dilemma and must therefore be met by collective leadership and action. When I talk about leadership, I'm not only talking about economic leadership. While that is important, I would like to suggest there is also a need for ethical leadership. In other words, the only way to ensure protection for the people is to ensure that public institutions are strong, resilient, and most importantly, clean. The pillar of a society is in its public institutions, which can be defined as the rules of the game, which govern the interaction within and between governments, markets, and society. Imagine if the rules of the game were not firm, or if the enforcement of these rules were lax. You will find irresponsible parties taking advantage of the system to enrich themselves, and worse, suppress the rights of others. That is how a corrupt and oppressive society is formed. Former World Bank President James Wolfenstone summarised it well by saying, the causes of financial crisis and poverty are one and the same. If countries do not have good governance, if they do not confront the issue of corruption, if they do not have a complete legal system which protects human rights, property rights and contracts, their development is fundamentally flawed and will not last. In other words, the relationship between public institutions and the social economic development of a society is a symbiotic one. Good and clean governance will result in a positive social economic development. Conversely, ineffective public institutions and weak governance will facilitate corruption, misguided allocation of resources, arbitrary justice, and excessive government intervention. This will in turn reduce economic competitiveness, deter private sector investment, and prejudice the distribution of wealth. True development is not merely material, but must also refer to the accessibility and availability of opportunity to a society. In other words, a truly developed society is one where its people are empowered with the freedom to fulfill their aspirations. In this, I'm guided by the great economies for the poor and an, the economic Nobel laureate, Amartya Sen, who questioned the fundamental assumption of development economics by arguing that development should not be measured primarily by wealth or income. According to Sen, Poverty is not merely material, but should also be seen as a deprivation of basic capabilities, which he defines as human freedoms. In other words, development is a process of expanding the instrumental freedoms of individuals, which he describes in five elemental forms. One, political freedoms. Two, economic freedoms. Three, social opportunities. Four, transparency guarantees. And lastly, protective security.